Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, it's lovely to see you all here tonight. I'm Kate. This is Anne taking a seat here. Um, I was saying earlier, my mission in writing this book was to ensure that the Radium Girls were remembered. And I want to say a special thank you to every single person in this room tonight, because in being here, in coming to hear Anne and I have a conversation about the Radium Girls, you are remembering them. You are thinking about them now, sitting in your seats. You have thought about them as you've booked your tickets and you've walked into this hall today. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing that, because you are honouring their memory, and that means so much to me. So thank you so much, all of you, for coming out tonight. I thought I would kick off by doing a short reading from the book, just so you can get a flavour of how I've told, you know, chosen to tell this real piece of American history. This is the first narrative non-fiction account of the women's story. That means it reads like a novel. It's accessible. I wanted anyone to be able to pick up this story, whether you were a kind of expert scientist or a, a doctor in cancer studies, or whether you were a high school student who wanted to read about women who were the same age as you when they started work, and you want to know what happened to them. And so it's written, I hope, in a very novelistic way, but everything in the book is true, and it's based on fact. So I'm going to read an edited extract from chapter one, as I say, just to set the scene a little bit and to introduce you to just one of the radium girls that I've chosen to write about. The setting is Newark in New Jersey, and the year is 1917. Catherine Sharp had a jaunty spring in her step as she walked the brief four blocks to work. It was February 1st, 1917, but the cold didn't bother her one bit. She had always loved the winter snows of her hometown. The frosty weather wasn't the reason for her high spirits on that particular icy morning, though. Today, she was starting a brand new job at the Watchdial Studio of the Radium Luminous Materials Corporation, based on 3rd Street in Newark, New Jersey. It was one of her close pals who had told her about the vacancy. Catherine was a lively, sociable girl with many friends. As she herself later recalled, a friend of mine told me about the watch studio where watch dial numerals and hands were painted with a luminous substance that made them visible in the dark. The work, she explained, was interesting and a far higher type than the usual factory job. It sounded so glamorous, even in that brief description. After all, it wasn't even a factory, but a studio. For Catherine, a girl who had a very imaginative temperament, it sounded like a place where anything could happen. It certainly beat the job she'd had before. Wrapping parcels at Bamberger's department store, Catherine had ambitions far beyond that shop floor. She was an attractive girl of just 14. Her 15th birthday was in five weeks' time. Standing just under five foot four, she was a very pretty little blonde, with twinkling blue eyes, fashionably bobbed hair, and delicate features. All her life, popular science later wrote, Catherine Sharp had cherished the desire to pursue a literary career. She was certainly go-getting. She later wrote that after her friend had given her word of the opportunities at the watch studio. I went to the man in charge, a Mr. Savoy, and asked for a job. And that was how she found herself, outside the factory on 3rd Street, knocking on the door and gaining admittance to the place where so many young women wanted to work. The girls sat in rows, 
dressed in their ordinary clothes and painting dials at top speed, their hands almost a blur to Catherine's uninitiated eyes. Each had a flat, wooden tray of dials beside her, but it wasn't the dials that caught Catherine's eye. It was the material they were using. It was the radium. It was a wonder element. Everyone knew that. Catherine had read all about it in magazines and newspapers, which were forever extolling its virtues and advertising new radium products for sale. But they were all far too expensive for a girl of Catherine's humble origins. She had never seen it up close before. It was the most valuable substance on earth, selling for $120,000 for a single gram. That's $2.2 million in today's values. To Catherine's delight, it was even more beautiful than she had imagined. Even as she watched, little puffs of it seemed to hover in the air before settling on the shoulders or hair of a dial painter at work. To her astonishment, it made the girls themselves gleam. They were using exceptionally fine camel hair brushes with narrow wooden handles, yet they had to make the brushes even finer. And there was only one way they knew of to do that. We put the brushes in our mouths, Catherine said, quite simply. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was a wonderful reading. Thank and you. I have to say, I read this book. I, I received a copy of it a couple months ago, and I, I read it, absolutely loved it. I found it mesmerizing. Oh, thank you. Um, but there are parts of it that are disturbing, and um, it really brings out your emotion because you're thinking, you're, you're feeling for these girls. So um, one thing I wanted to start with, you, you have written so many different books, so many different types of things, yeah. humor and memoir, and you've um, done um, writing with other people, and you've mm -hmm. done gift books, um, children's books, and what made you turn your attention to this. So if you could describe a little bit of how you got the idea and, and then why you decided to make it into a, a book of this type. Okay, um, well, I think probably the thing to kind of preface it by saying is that I consider myself a storyteller. So even though the books that I've written have all been very different, um, I think the kind of unifying factor about them is that they tell stories and part of that storytelling background is also about how I discovered the story of the Radium Girls. And you can all hear that I'm not from around these parts. <laughs> this is a chapter of American history and I am very British. Um, and how I discovered it uh, was through a play, through telling their story on stage as a director. And I discovered the play through Googling great plays for women. I knew nothing about the Radium Girls. I was simply looking for another play to direct that had you know, a female-centric storyline and strong female parts for actresses to play. And as soon as I read the opening monologue of Melanie Marnich's These Shining Lives, which is about the dial painters from Illinois, I was absolutely gripped. It's a beautiful script, but this story, this powerful story, these incredible, courageous women, they just spoke to me somehow. The story just resonated with me. And the way the book came about was that that resonance um, also meant that I felt this enormous responsibility that as a director and as a director leading a cast of actors, we all had a responsibility to do justice to these women. Because, as I mentioned um, slightly earlier, this is not Hamlet and Ophelia. This is Catherine Dunahoo, Tom Dunahoo, Charlotte Purcell. These are real people with real families. These are true events that we were depicting on stage. 
And so I felt determined that we had to do those people justice. And therefore, I conducted a lot of research before I even staged a single scene, before we even did our first read-through. I conducted all this research. I read everything I could find on the women. I gave a mini presentation to my cast, showing them pictures of the people we were playing, because it was so important to me that they understood as well. And what I discovered through that research and through reading the other books that exist on the women, which are excellent, is that there was no book that centred on the women themselves. This was the Radium Girls story, but somehow the Radium Girls had been excised and kind of pushed to the side and their own voices had been silenced. And so I felt a determination that that you know, needed to be corrected, that a mission needed to be resolved. And so I thought, even though I'm British, if, if no one else has done it in that way, why don't I do it? And so that resonance that the story had had with me from minute one took me all the way across an ocean into America to travel around and, and do my research and to try and bring these real women to life, just as I had once done with my actors on stage, but now hopefully to make them live again through this novelistic retelling which uses their own voices, their own first-person accounts of what happened to them. And in terms of being a storyteller and why did I write this book, well, it was a book that somehow demanded to be told and demanded that I tell it. And that's how it came to be. So, so I'm a cancer researcher, and all cancer researchers learn about radiation, that it's, that it's dangerous. Yes. It, it, it can be very helpful for treatment, but for um, other exposures, it can cause cancer. And we, we learned that all early in our careers. Um, but we, we, we learn about numbers. And so we learn about numbers of people that might be exposed, numbers of people that get cancer, number of people that don't. But what you've done is you've put faces into this and you've put hearts and lives into this. And so how did, how did, you, how did you do that? How did you, like you said, you did some interviews and you went around the country, but how did you actually bring them to life so, so well? Because you really feel you're following these women around and their loved ones, you really feel like you're there. Yeah, well, that, um, thank you so much for saying that because that was my ambition in writing the book. I wanted these women to feel real because, as I say, I kind of felt they'd been whitewashed out of their own story and their own history. And in terms of how did I make them real, well, I mentioned the first-person accounts. That was obviously my primary source in terms of understanding who they were because I read the court testimonies that these women gave. And from that, you can very easily see, you know, who is the feisty radium girl who um, is kind of strong in the face of the company lawyers grilling her on the stand. You know, that's Grace Fryer. She had, um, ironically, because the radium had actually crushed Grace's vertebrae, so she had to wear a steel back brace. But actually, Grace had, in fact, ironically, the strongest backbone of perhaps all the radium girls. She was so feisty, she stood up, you know, when actually even all the other girls felt that perhaps there was no hope. Grace was the one who kept trying, lawyer after lawyer, she would not take no for an answer. And it was through resources like that that you realise, okay, well, that's Grace's personality. And then we introduced, you know, I introduced you to Catherine Sharp. Then, well, Catherine Sharp, I described how she wanted to pursue a literary career. She did actually do that. She wrote a memoir which had an extract published in a reformers magazine. And so I was able to get to know Catherine through her own account of what it was like to be a radium girl. I learnt, you know, why she uh, took the dial painting job in the first place. I learnt what it was like after she left dial painting. And she talked about how she liked playing the piano and singing songs that were popular in those days. And it's through these first-person accounts that you can get to know the women. And, of course, they're all different, just as you and I are all different. Mm -hmm. And so what I tried to do in the book was to bring out those individual personalities. Mm -hmm. And of course, the other critical part of the research was the privilege that I had of interviewing their family members. So I interviewed sisters, 
nieces, nephews, sons, daughters. And they, of course, know the individual radium girls better than anyone. And they were able to describe for me what they were really like, you know, who was the talker who would have, you know, always have an anecdote or a funny joke to tell. Who was the girl who was quieter, who was sweet-natured and, you know, like the simple things in life. And I, you know, as I interviewed the families, I was asking them things like, you know, what were their ambitions? What did they like to cook? And it was through these, you know, very personal, detailed, intimate, you know, things that I was learning that I hope I've added that personal colour to each girl in the book so that readers can discover their individual personalities too. Did anything surprise you? Um, did anything surprise me? I think the surprise for me as I was researching, I think came because understandably, um, Melanie Marnich in her play has fictionalized certain elements. Mm -hmm. And that includes the characters, of course, because you know she didn't know what the girls were like. She's written a fabulous play. Um, but Charlotte Purcell in the play is this incredibly... Um, she's a brilliant character. She, um, she drinks, she smokes, she swears. She's a kind of gin-swigging flapper who goes out dancing. <laughs> she's got all the sass that you can imagine. <laughs> and I met Charlotte's um, grandchildren and her son, and I was interviewing them, and they were all like... That was not Charlotte. <laughs> you know, she was incredibly devout. Um, <laughs> you know, kind of her Catholicism was, you know, that was her kind of passion in life. She would never have sworn or done any of that. You know, she had the same nature as Charlotte in the play in terms of, you know, it was Charlotte Purcell who got the other women together who determined, you know, we're going to fight this thing. We're going to do something about these companies that have poisoned us. But I think the surprise was discovering those elements because I'd learned of the story first through a play was the differences, you know, what was true, what wasn't, and that, that was the surprising thing, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, bringing up um, the issue of women really, really seems so relevant that these women were so strong that they dealt with this terrible illness and mm -hmm. yet were able to um, move things along and, and fight for workers' rights and fight for their law cases. Um, but but um, they weren't really accepted right away that they did have an illness. So I remember one place you say that um, one of the physicians um, pronounced that his test showed that there was no radium in the women. He was convinced that their health was caused by their nerves. Um, and then you, you point out that it was a common response to women's occupational illnesses, um, that it was often attributed to female hysteria. Um, and the word yeah. hysteria, I was always surprised when I was younger to understand that that came from the word hist um, for uterus. So the word hysteria is, is really from a woman's body. And it's really, it's over the years, it's been attributed, many women's conditions have been attributed to um, there's something wrong with them, they're hysterical, especially if it's something that the medical community doesn't understand yet. Mm. Absolutely. I, I think the women's gender played a huge part in their story, and we can see that in the way that doctors responded to it. You're absolutely right. They, they were completely foxed by it, and even though the girls were kind of getting together, and Catherine Sharp herself said, there is something going on about this thing. You know, she and the other women were meeting and trying to get something going, but the doctors often didn't listen to them. And one of the striking things about the story is that even though the first radium girl dies in September 1922, it's not actually until June 1925 that they properly start doing autopsies to try and figure out what's going on. And 1922 to 1925, a lot of women have died in that period of time. Not one of them has been autopsied. It's only when a male employee of the firm dies that the doctors do an autopsy. It was the man they autopsied first. Only after that did they start autopsying the radium girls. And they finally figured out that it was the radium that had killed them. And a brilliant doctor called Dr. Harrison Martland devised these tests that he could test the living women 
and measure the radium inside them to figure out that it was the radium. And he had to devise those tests because it, this was a type of radiation poisoning that had never been seen before in human beings. So it was all very pioneering stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, one question that the audience might be interested in knowing is why were women doing these jobs? Because it was in, in those days, the early 20s, uh, 1920s, you said, um, it, often women were expected to be at home or they wouldn't be um, out in the workforce, they wouldn't work after they got married and had children, um, and they wouldn't get prime jobs. These were pretty well-paying jobs, So, but why were women a allowed to work there? Why did they get selected for those jobs? Yeah, and um, you're right, that it, it was incredibly lucrative. The dial painters were in the top 5% of female wage earners nationally, and some of them actually earned more than their husbands and fathers. As to why it was women that did it, I think it's important to say it was generally young women who did it. So Catherine Sharp was 14 on that first day in the job, and she was typical. Most style painters were between 14 and 18 years of age. Records show that some were as young as 11. And they were kind of suited to this work, because if you think of the tiny, tiny numbers on watches, you know, some of them were only a millimeter in width, the numbers that they had to paint, and the girls couldn't go over the parameters. And the kind of, you know, the small hands of these young teenage women were particularly suited to this job, I think. It was very artistic work. Obviously, men can be brilliant artists as well, but there was something about it that it just seemed to be, it was, well, it didn't seem to be, it was only women that were recruited for it. And you talked about how unusual it was for women to be working at this time. Well, because the women were so young, actually it was a job they did before they then went off and got married and had babies. That, you know, this was something they did in their adolescence. And it's also important to say that you know, we talked about Catherine starting work on February 1st, 1917. Well, only a few months later, in the April, America joined the First World War, which led to a real boom in the radium industry because the radium girls were not just painting watches and clocks. They were painting aeronautical dials. So if you think of a dashboard on an aeroplane or on a ship with those glowing instruments... It was the radium girls who were painting those. So in terms of why was it women, well, part of it was the war effort as well. So some of your male workforce will be going off to fight in France. And so it was a way for women to do their bit for the war effort. Mm -hmm. Well, you describe, as I mentioned in the beginning, that um, you describe in detail what's happening to these women. And so I found it, it was a very emotional read. How about you? Did, did you? did you feel emotions as you were going through this, and, and how did you get through that? Um, oh, yes, there were emotions. Um, yes, I, I wrote with pictures of the women displayed around my desk, all the individual girls that I was writing about. And so when I was writing about their pain, whether it was the pain of the radium destroying their jawbone, whether it was the pain of a miscarriage or a stillbirth that a woman was going through, that grief, whether it was describing their death from radium poisoning. I would look at the girl as I was writing and I'd try and kind of communicate with her as I was trying to bring her to life even as I was describing her death. And so it was incredibly emotional. I did cry. I would sit there typing with tears streaming down my face um, but I hope that that emotion that I felt, you know, enhances the book because I hope it makes readers feel the grief that I was feeling as I was describing it, mm -hmm. as they too read and, mm -hmm. you know, experience the same. And the, the book is, it brings up so many issues and one thing is workers' rights and it, so it's, it was women's health rights but also workers' rights and um, in, in, in this country, in the United States, we have government organizations that will help control, regulate various things. So there's one called OSHA, um, Occupational mm -hmm. Safety and, and um, Health Administration. I think some, it yeah, sounds right. Yeah. And, um, and then we have the Environmental Protection Agency. And I re learned recently that... Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. So it's even more timely. Um, but, but OSHA 
um, guidelines for what's a, um, considered an acceptable um, level of exposure to some toxin is not e even as strict as the Environmental Protection Agency. And the idea is that it's supposed to be healthy people work in, in, um, in industry, mm -hmm. um, and so that they, they think that they could handle more than the general population could. So it's concerning on several levels. It doesn't say anything about pregnant women, for, and they're gonna have very vulnerable um, fetuses inside them. Um, and it doesn't say anything about um, people that may be older or sick for some reason that could have be at, at some exposure um, and have been at high risk from that exposure. Um, and then the other thing is that um, if, if our government regulations are loosened, then what's gonna happen for the next radiation type exposure? How bad's mm -hmm. that gonna be? Um, and, um, you know, we haven't, uh, I mentioned before to you that um, Washington State has a, a huge um, radiation problem in our um, Hanford <laughs> reservation, um, and we've had um, recent leaks, um, and it, it, the, the radioactive waste there um, accounts for about two thirds of what's in the United, entire United States. So it's a very wow. um, busy place. Um, what's also concerning, what covers that cleanup, they've been doing a cleanup for years and years. Mm -hmm. It's covered by the Department of Energy, which is now directed by somebody who thought energy was just oil. Didn't even know what he was getting in charge of. So it's complicated. You have um, workers' rights that uh, try to cover some of this you have for, if you have it, a spill. You have um, another organization. Mm -hmm. And then you have the whole environment that could be um, um, affected by this. Mm -hmm. And so we really do rely a great deal on government regulations. And your book really points out what happens when they didn't <laughs> exist at all, or they were yeah. rudimentary, or they weren't applied well. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it, it you know, it, it, obviously in some ways quite by chance because who who knew <laughs> we would be in this situation when I wrote the book, you know, um, all of that was um, not predicted. Um, but obviously the, as it happens, um, the publication of the book has seemingly come at a very timely moment because you know the book does talk about OSHA and it talks about the EPA because the EPA were integral in cleaning up the radioactive waste and kind of contamination that these firms um, caused because obviously you know these factories were right in the heart of their communities and so there was a massive cleanup operation that the EPA spearheaded so it is a very timely publication and I think it reads both I think it reads on several levels, actually. I think it reads as a cautionary tale of what can happen if we roll back the regulations, of what can happen if we trust companies to tell the truth and to adhere to their own regulations. Um, obviously, they don't. Um, but I think as well as serving as a cautionary tale and a reminder of why such regulations are necessary and how hard fought they were, you know, people died for the protections that we currently enjoy. I hope it also serves as an inspirational tale because what the Radium Girls did was exceptional. It was groundbreaking. And these girls, just as I described Catherine to you in that opening chapter, they were young women, they were poor, they were working class, often they were ill-educated and they were, as their gender dictated at that time, you know, they were almost second-class citizens. They were actively silenced again and again. And yet, they spoke up. They used the voice that they had to make a difference. And so I hope in these troubled times that are troubling for so many of us, I hope they serve as inspiration that no matter how small you are and no matter how powerless you feel, if you band together with like-minded people just as the Radium Girls did, then you can make a difference, because they did. Thank you. Would you like to run for politics over here? <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's something that happened last night. I was um, doing, um, I'd, I'd read your book before and I'd done some um, thinking of what to talk with you about. Mm -hmm. And last night I decided, well, I should do some research. And, and so I got onto Dr. Google and looked up um, radium clocks. Uh -huh. And um, 
the, one of the first things that popped up was a picture of, of various clocks, including one that looked extremely familiar. And it turned out we had one in our house. Wow. In the other room, <laughs> my, a clock my husband inherited a couple, about 20 years ago. So luckily it wasn't there when our kids were little. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, the picture is identical. There, it, it's, you know, we must have one of those radiation clocks in there. So that yeah. clock is now in our basement. <laughs> but... <laughs> but um, but I did look up on, on the um, uh, US government site that, that describes this, and a lot of people have these old things in their houses, mm -hmm. old clocks that were radiation, um, uh, radium dial clocks, or um, some old ceramics, old tiles, um, old um, dishes, fiesta ware, reddish fiesta ware. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of those were used, had some sort of radiation, radium, put in with some kind of substance yeah. like that that en enhance the color, so which is why they're in ceramics and tiles. Um, so you, are you learning about these things as you go around? Are you um, hearing more about that? Several people have, have said, just as you did, I, I've got a clock like that. Mm. Um, so pe people are asking about it. And I thought what was really interesting was I was in um, Albuquerque on Monday <laughs> speaking at the Museum for Nuclear Science and History that is there. And what was striking to me is they had a display of the radium craze, that craze Catherine is describing in that opening chapter where newspapers and magazines are talking about it and there's all these radium products. You know, it wasn't just the radium clocks. Radium, at the time the radium girls were working, was seen as this, not just a cure-all, but an elixir of youth. And so it was in everything. People took it for hay fever or high blood pressure. People took it as a vitamin. You know, they literally drank radium water in the same way that we might take a wheatgrass shot today. You know, the, the recommended dose was five to seven glasses a day. And what was striking to me about this display in the museum is they had a radium clock and they had a poster for the radium cosmetics that you could get at that time. And they, had a, uh, they actually had a bottle of the Radithor radium tonic um, that people used to drink. But there was no mention of the radium girls. Um, and I hope they're going to correct that omission. <laughs> so, um, so you're right, people are asking about it because it was widespread. It, you know, people still have those clocks in their homes. I wonder if some people don't know, like, do you hear from the younger people? They don't, do they even know about radiation, what radiation exposure is and what, what dangers it could be? Because, you know, I know in this country for a while, it was popular to do CT scans, get your whole body CT, mm -hmm. CT scanned in case there's something, you can find something, and then maybe you'll get it taken out early. And it's, they really weren't tested. There was, in, in terms of evidence-based medicine, it wasn't there. Nobody had tested whether somebody was gonna have a more, a better or longer life by getting one of these full body CT scans. And the, and the reason that the docs were concerned about this was because of this full body radiation people were gonna get. Mm. But yeah, I'm wondering, like do, do young people even know or or the general population even know about radiation dangers? Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, obviously I can only speak from the people that I've met. Um, but yeah, I think people are aware of it, certainly. And I was doing some events yesterday in um, Boulder in Cor Colorado, a, a local high school. I went in and um, very bizarrely for me being a kind of editor, English graduate, I was lecturing in a science hall <laughs> with the periodic table <laughs> on the wall. <laughs> I never would have predicted that in my future. But those students had been learning about radiation. They, they knew all about it. So um, I, think, I think young people do understand the dangers. They learn about alpha, beta, and gamma rays and you know all the things that I actually talk about in the book because obviously the science of radium and is what, what is happening to the women is important for readers to understand as well. What I would say is because I'm not a scientist or a doctor, um, I'm a storyteller, it's written as part of the story, but it still has to be in there because how else do you explain how you go from radium being this wonder element to radium being this silent and deadly and very stealthy killer of women? Mm -hmm. And these women were really heroes, weren't they? <clears throat> um, yes. They, you know, so they they died, but they were very brave and worked to try to, um, it, to yeah. advance the case. It, it was complete altruism. That that's one of the things that I find so striking about the story, because.
these women, you know, as you know, once you have radium in your bones, there is no way of getting it out. So by the time the doctor's finally figuring out, you know, what has happened to the girls, they're not just saying, yes, it's the radium. They're saying, it's the radium and there is no cure. You're going to die. Mm -hmm. And the women took that death sentence and almost stared death in the face and decided to do something about it. And I think that's extraordinary because this legal fight that they embark on that changed laws and changed workers' rights to protect all of us, they did it all knowing there was no hope for them. Mm -hmm. And I think Grace Fryer is the radium girl who sums it up best of all. Because when she took her company to court and she was holding them to account for what they'd done to her and her friends, she said, it is not for myself that I am thinking, but for the hundreds of other girls to whom this may serve as an example. And I think the radium girls serve as an example to all of us in that selfless act. And it really was selfless. And these women literally used their last breaths to speak out against injustice and against corporate corruption. You know, Catherine Dunahoo, one of the Illinois dial painters, literally gave evidence against the firm on her deathbed. You know, she was too weak to go to court, and so they actually brought the court to her in the sitting room in East Superior Street in Ottawa, Illinois. Catherine lay on her blue couch with a white blanket pulled up to her chin, barely you know, strong enough to open her eyes. A lot of the time she gave evidence with her eyes shut and the judge was there and the lawyers were there. And Catherine, could, you know, her doctors said, don't do this, you know, you have a fatal illness, but if you do it, you know, it may prove immediately fatal to you. And yet she still did it. She still insisted that she wanted to go ahead, that she wanted her lawyer, Leonard Grossman, to bring the court to her. And I just think that determination to hold this company to account, to, to do it not for her, because there was no hope for her, but for her friends, for the family that she was going to have to leave behind when she died, for her children. You know, that strength and courage just to me is so extraordinary and that's just one example of these amazing women who fought for others rather than for themselves. And the women did get some help didn't they? They had some men in their lives and can you talk they, about they that? They did yeah. yeah absolutely and I think that's really important to say because obviously it's getting a lot of press as a female book and strong women and it is all of those things but these women didn't do it alone. And I think, you know, any society we're going to build that we hope will be equal needs to have men in it as well. You know, it's not just about the women being amazing. It's about the men who are amazing and help them and give them a voice and support them as well, just as we would want in a utopian society. And so those amazing men are people like Leonard Grossman, the Illinois women's lawyer, who worked pro bono and was absolutely incredible and steadfast in keeping the fight going for them. People like Raymond Berry, who was the New Jersey girl's lawyer, where every other lawyer had turned it down. Um, the girls there were kind of stymied by the statute of limitations, um, whereby there was only two years to file suit. Um, you know, from the point of injury, you had two years, at which point you had to say to your company, I'm suing. Well, radium poisoning normally takes at least five years to show itself. So by the time the statute had run out, the girls didn't even know they were sick. But Raymond Berry, who was this brilliant lawyer, was the only one who kind of came up with these ways of trying to get around the statute and was the only one who was brave enough to take the case. And they were assisted too by people like Dr. Harrison Martland, you know, devising those tests, speaking up for the women. You know, he was the first pioneering medical doctor who published and said, it's the radium girl, you know, it's the radium that's hurt the girls. This is a new occupational poisoning. We need to take action. And he was completely discredited. You know, all he was trying to do was bring awareness to this 
new poisoning, which affected not just the radium girls, but the general population, all those people drinking their radium tonics and popping pills, you know, <laughs> 10 a day or whatever, um, he was completely discredited because, of course, the radium companies who were making money hand over fist from this very lucrative industry didn't want an expert like Harrison Martland standing up and saying, you know what, radium medicine is a load of quackery and you shouldn't listen to a word you read in the newspapers. Um, you know, of course they tried to discredit everyone who supported the women, but these champions kept on fighting for the girls regardless. And the companies, if I remember right, the companies paid some physicians. So paying somebody not to talk about something. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and they also paid experts to put out, you know, conflicting reports so that while Martland was the voice of reason, as we now know it, you know, he was the doctor who solved that medical mystery. The companies were funding research that said the exact opposite. And that was published and, you know, they were, I mean, some of the activities of the companies described in this book are shocking, even to this day and age when you think, well, you know companies are corrupt and they're going to behave appallingly. They beh behave even more appallingly than you would expect. You know, mm -hmm. the, the level to, to which they sank um, are shocking. Were there things you, so you did a lot of research, you came to the United States, you were a month here? Yeah, doing research. that's right, yeah. So you must, and, and you did a lot of document searches with, with the things you had to leave out that, that, that yes. kind of, that made you feel like you, it didn't, wasn't part of the story but you, and you couldn't fit it in but you really wished you could have put yeah. it in? Yeah, yeah, and, and there were a variety of things with that, you know, some of them to do with the women as well. So Quinta McDonald, who is one of the New Jersey dial painters, she actually came from a marriage that was violent. She suffered domestic abuse. And I found lots of, you know, articles about that. Her husband, while she was crippled from the radium, tried to kill her. He turned on all the gas jets in the house and tried to gas her and her children to death, um, which is obviously a hugely shocking, dramatic, awful thing to happen. You've got this girl who is literally crippled and dying and that is how her husband treats her. Mm -hmm. And in my original draft, I described that dramatically in the story, but I had over-delivered because there was so much good stuff that I wanted to put in. And so I had to edit and I edited a lot out and that was one of the things that had to you know, be cut from that dramatic um, account of what really happened between Quinta and James and I boiled it down to a kind of paragraph told in flashback. So there were things like that that I had included originally that when you look at, when you are editing and you're thinking, okay, you know, I've only got a finite amount of words to tell this story. Is what happened to Quinta part of the Radium Girls story? Is it part of that fight for justice? And well, no, it's part, it's her story, but it's not part of, this book. So there were things like that that I had to leave out. Um, and even more, you know, some of the historical detail, you know, exactly how, you know, the, the desks look that the girls painted at and all those kind of tiny details that I'd found. Again, you're looking, I've only got a finite amount of words, I'd over-delivered, I had to cut. And it's, you kind of end up weighing up, well, I either keep Catherine on her sofa in East Superior Street or I keep Quinta and James, and then you say, well, Catherine is much more important, so you have to, even though it hurts, you have to make that cut, um, because ultimately cutting it makes it a slicker book, it makes it more accessible for people, and that means more people will remember them, hopefully, and enjoy the book and talk about it, and so it's to the girls' benefit to make those edits. So you've done some acting and you directed the play. Do you think that helped you? You mentioned the word drama several times and you're yeah. talking. Does that, do you think that helped you um, set the, the book up, set the scenes, and then move the action along? Do you think all of that experience really helped you with writing this particular I, I'm book? Sh I'm sure it fee feeds into it. I, mean, I guess it comes back to what I said at the start about being a storyteller and whether mm -hmm. you're a storyteller as an author, as an actress, as a director. They're similar skills, I think, you know, it's about occupying a character, really getting into the girls' minds, whether you're doing that as an actress, director, or an author. And I think you're right in terms of the pacing, perhaps, in terms of where do you leave a 
chapter with a cliffhanger, hopefully, to encourage people to read on. It's about seeing the drama in the reality of what happened to them. So some of the kind of revelations that I've chosen, you know, I've chosen in the book not to give everything away when it first happens. Sometimes I delay that knowledge coming to the reader so that hopefully it will pack more of a punch when they get there. And as I say, I think that is about storytelling. And I think, it, I think my acting and directing probably does mm -hmm. feed into it as mm -hmm. well. And story is how people learn too, isn't it? You, 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 you might give um, patients or the public information about this statistic or this, your risk of something is going to go up if you do this or that. But if you have a story like what you've written that um, showing what happens and showing the mm. devastation it hap that happens to the woman, to the family, to all the people around, it really brings it to life and yeah. it helps people understand, I think, better that particular health issue. Yeah, I, I hope so. I mean, as, as I said, you know, for me it was always about the individual women and the book is actually dedicated to all the dial painters and those who love them. Mm. And you're right, I wasn't just looking at the radium girls. I was looking at the children who had to grow up without their mothers. I was looking at the husbands who had to bury their wives. I was looking at the parents who had to bury their daughters. And sometimes, because the job was so lucrative and so attractive to people, sometimes those parents are not just burying one daughter, but two or three or four, because the women encouraged each other to join them at the studio. Catherine Sharp got a job for her cousin Irene Rudolph at the studio, and Irene died. And Catherine died as well, and it actually really had a very negative impact on Catherine, seeing her cousin die. Mm -hmm. And she talks about that in, in the book. And so you're right, for me it was it was about bringing the women to life, but it was also about putting a human face on this tragedy, on this piece of history. Because I think you can read about a radium girl in you know, a radiation manual or a textbook probably, but unless you've gone on that journey with Catherine Sharp and you've seen her grief and you've seen the grief of her father and you've met Catherine and Tom Donahue and seen what the radium poisoning does to their family, it's only through learning those stories that you can really feel and kind of put a human face to the tragedy. And I think that's really important. And I think that's important not just for this story, but other stories as well. You know, we were talking earlier about Flint, Michigan, and, you know, things like this. And I think unless, you know, you can read the headlines, but I don't think it, it means as much until you read about a particular family or a particular person it's affected because then it's real, then you can empathize, then you can really anticipate and imagine what this has really done to people because these are people's lives and that's what I hope the book drives home is that these were people's lives. Yes, the women became, you know, they le left this scientific legacy, they were studied for decades but these were individuals, these were humans, and I hope I put a human face on this piece of history in how I've chosen to tell the story. Yeah, and I think another issue is that um, it happens around the world that workers feel desperate, they need a job, they'll go work wherever they can um, get a job sometimes or where they can get paid the most money. And um, if they are having health effects, they may not feel like they can complain about it. They may not even realize it. Sometimes, like this, it took several years. Um, and, um, and so it's gonna be an ongoing problem. You've had this problems of different types of exposures in the UK. We have a lot in the US. We have many in other countries of things we're buying their goods and, and, um, and their factory conditions may be poor. And even, you may have risks in a, something that looks like a perfectly safe environment. You get somebody to sit all day long. It's a very different type of risk, but it's still a health issue. So I think this is, is it's really critical. Workers' health, workers' rights, um, workers' protection is really gonna be important. So it brings that up too. So it is, I, was, I, was, I really thought the book had brought out so many different themes that are 
relevant today, even though you're writing about an historical event, mm. it's not over. It's still no. relevant. And, and I hope, you know, people reading it will think, well, let's make sure that they didn't die in vain. Let's be vigilant about the regulations and mm. let's be aware if there are new forms of occupational poisoning, however they may come about. Mm -hmm. If people start trying to blow whistles and things like that, let's give them the time of day. Let's listen. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, uh, yeah. and I, I heard noises from the audience. I bet there's a lot of questions <laughs> for you. Yeah. Uh, like Ms. Moore, I grew up in England hmm. um, a long time ago, and I had a watch that had luminescent dials, probably in the 50s. Was that still radium? Um, prob probably, yeah, ra they kept radium dial painting, that kept going for decades. So that kept going, and was that, in the form of a watch, was that a problem? Uh, was it contained, or was it, were you liable for exposure? Um, I have to say, <laughs> Anne is probably more of an expert than I am. My understanding, from what I have learned, is that the people that bought the watches were generally safe because... The what was really dangerous was ingesting the radium. The most dangerous rays are the alpha rays, and normally with a watch, there will be a bit of glass across the radium which would stop those alpha rays from getting out. I do know, having said that though, that I think it was in the <clears throat> 1960s, New York banned the sale of radium pocket watches because they were worried that having a pocket watch close to the genitals um, might have you know, poor, you know, it might affect the sperm of men and that sort of thing. So they ban I know they banned the sale of radium pocket watches. It, I think it was in the 1960s they did that. So Thank you very much. Okay. You may have answered this question with the one that you just gave, but you were talking about the women wearing their own clothes yes. and the clouds of dust. Yes. So I wondered if any of that came home with them like, say, asbestos did. Yes. Um, I, I can only answer anecdotally, but I did find in the records at the National Archives, there was a very sad case which described two sisters, and the sisters used to share a bed. One of them was a dial painter, one of them, the other one wasn't. But the sister who wasn't a dial painter died of radium poisoning because her sister came home covered in the dust, they shared a bed, and the non-dial painting sister died of radium poisoning. You mentioned a miscarriage, but I'm wondering mm. if there were any documented health effects in their children. And um, This is always an interesting question for me to answer. So there's been no scientific studies on the children. So yeah, they, they, ne they never did. They studied the women for decades, but they never studied the children as a you know, proper scientific study. Um, so I can only answer anecdotally. Um, and anecdotally, from the women that I wrote about, um, there was a, it was a real split, to be honest. Um, it definitely seemed to affect the women's fertility because there was a high number of pe women struggling to get pregnant. Those that succeeded in falling pregnant suffered miscarriages, suffered stillbirths, st suffered premature births. But the children that um, resulted, if they were able to come to term, some of them were absolutely fine. There seemed to be no ill effects, which seemed to be if the, the mother was not badly affected by radium poisoning at the time she was pregnant. As, as I said, you know, radium poisoning takes years to show itself. So if you have your children early days, they're probably going to be fine. But there are definitely examples that I write about in the book which, where it did seem to affect the children, where there was stunted growth, where there was, um, you know, the children died young, both of Catherine Donahue's children seem to have been affected because she had her children late, so she was very badly affected with radium poisoning when she was pregnant. And the families certainly are convinced that the radium hurt them too. Now, I'm going to preface this because um, at a Q&A I did in Illinois, I had a biologist who spoke up when I gave that answer, and he said, I'm sure the radium wouldn't have hurt the children. Radium's a bone seeker. It couldn't have been passed on. But what I say to that, not being a doctor, is that even if the radium wasn't itself in the children, it had, of course, poisoned their mothers. So their mothers have fatal anemia, 
Um, the medical records talk of how you're supposed to have, I think, about 8,000 white blood cells, and Catherine had a, a few hundred. So if you're having a baby when you have that kind of anemia, it's, it's not going to go well because your body doesn't have the nutrients that it has. And so those children certainly do seem to have been affected. Well, radiation will also often go first to um, rapidly multiplying cells. And uh, that's what a fetus is, rapidly multiplying. Okay, so what did the biologist know? <laughs> I, I wish you were there to, to counteract it. A couple of naive questions, I'm afraid. Um, did any of the radium girls, did they all die young, say before the age of 30, or some of them survived longer? No, they did survive longer. And that, and that when we were talking earlier about what surprised you, what surprised me was they didn't all die young. When I directed the play, there was this enormous sense of tragedy because you think all these women, you know, died early doors. Actually, they didn't. And that's actually why the women were able to leave this scientific legacy because they were studied for decades. They were studied into their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s because sometimes they lived that long with the radium in their bones. Now, it's important to say, of course, some of them, many of them did die very young. <laughs> And some of them died from um, sarcomas, cancerous bone tumours that are, are, are very rare. And that's a direct result of the radium poisoning. But those sarcomas were almost like a time bomb. They were, you know, the radium that the girls had ingested as teenagers. Sometimes those sarcomas wouldn't start to grow until the woman was in her 40s. So it was, you know, it affected them, even though they didn't all die young the files at the Argonne National Laboratory that I studied, which was where all these scientific studies resulted, they showed that even if the women didn't die, they had bone changes in their skeletons. I talked of how Grace Fryer's spine was crushed. Well, what the radium did in the women was to destroy their bones. So the doctors said that they were honeycombed and moth-eaten. The radium literally drilled holes in their bones while the women were still alive. And so those women who didn't die young, they still had to contend with that for decades. And what happened was, it was the older the woman was when she dial painted, the more likely she was to live longer. It was the very young te teenagers who, who died early. The older women survived for longer. And the, and the fewer years, understandably, the fewer years a woman dial painted, the less likely she was to die. But as I said, I read hundreds and hundreds of names in the files. And over and over again, it said, died of sarcoma, sarcoma, sarcoma. And, you know, also things like amputation of left leg, bilateral amputations of, you know, both arms. Because the women would try and cut out the cancerous tumours. So they didn't all die young, but by God did they feel it even if they survived. One quick question, follow up, um, as far as cancer. Um, I don't think the term cancer was used until, I don't know, maybe the last 50 to 100 years, I don't know, and they called it, you know, wasting disease or whatever. Um, so I, we know that there are a lot of different causes of cancer now, and sometimes we don't know what some of the causes are, but was this considered cancer? I mean, was, was it recognized as a form of cancer um, immediately, or did they just call it radium poisoning? You probably know oh, more no, about could, the, the, the yeah the bone effect wasn't a cancer the what you the first thing that the women were dying of young the the, the destroyed bones that was um, like necrosis they call it like it's called what happened to their jaw is called osteonecrosis of the jaw and they were getting it in their other bones but but later a little bit later on cancer often takes a little while to develop the sarcoma is a cancer right. and they would have called that a cancer then and these women probably some of them would would also have gotten leukemia and the, or they, yeah, they their did. families that were exposed would have gotten leukemia too so and they they were calling those yeah they were calling those cancers they just may not, for sometimes they wouldn't tell people the patients but that was common for naturally occurring cancers as well. They may not tell them you have a cancer. They tell them something else. Um, th this story kind of um, is a story that I grew up with. I grew up in New Jersey. Okay. I worked at Van Bergers when I was in high Did school. Did you? Yeah, sold, <laughs> Just like Catherine. Yeah, I sold vacuum and luggage. They were, they were across <laughs> the aisle. Um, and I think it was my 
great grand aunt, I think. I grew up with the story that she was a radium girl. Wow. And she, she painted dials and she yeah. died from uh, bone cancer in her, in her jaw. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering, I haven't read the book yet, but this is, you know, kind of stirred up all these little of memories course, that yeah. I have. Um, when my grandmother, um, she got into a genealogy at some point and did this huge tree. I've got to find it. It's in some cabinet somewhere <laughs> at my mom's house back in New Jersey. Um, how many how many women were actually affected by this? How many were there, and was there um, was there any you know recompense to these women? I mean, obviously there's the societal changes and the, the laws that were passed and stuff like this. But did did they get anything? I mean, any, anything to ease their pain and their suffering on this? I mean, it must have been a lot of people. I mean, I think we even had a couple of the you know glowing watch faces when I was growing up too. Yeah. Um, very nice to meet you, by the way. I always, I always <laughs> love meeting relatives of the Radium yeah. Girls, so thank you so much for coming. Um, in terms of how many women were affected, mm -hmm. we really can't say. Um, it's, it's thousands, but there's not an exact number mm -hmm. because the employment records at that time just don't exist. Um, often what happened as well is um, it would just be like a summer job for some women or, you know, it was very, it's not like they were kind of, you know, they had contracts and it was all documented. The women worked, um, were paid kind of piece, <coughs> piece work, so the, by the amount of dials they painted. And it was very much like you came into the studio one day, you didn't the next, and, you know, um, so there, there aren't the employment records. And, of course, even beyond the employment records, so many of the girls were misdiagnosed, you know, and even if they died of cancer, it doesn't necessarily say that was cancer due to radium poisoning. So there's no statistic. In terms of recompense, um, unfortunately, no, they didn't get anything. This was very much a, a moral victory. There is um, a handful of women got some settlements, but many of them were not high. And there's actually a really shocking example I can tell you about in Connecticut, because dial painting happened all across America, and I look a little bit about uh, Connecticut. And the company there settled with some of the girls and for Mildred Cardo, who died aged 22, just six months after she got married, the company went to her newly widowed husband and said, if you absolve us of responsibility, we will give you a financial settlement. And for his wife's death, they offered him $43.75. And she, she, you know, she was offered a settlement. Many of them weren't. But I think that just indicates how little recompense there was. Yeah. Well, first off, I think this is a compliment. This was a, a very hard book to read. <laughs> so it's a tough story. I, I appreciate the, the uh, effort to put it in. Thank you. Worthwhile, but Thank difficult. You. <laughs> um, and then I have a question of curiosity. Um, other countries, so, you know, the way our laws didn't work then, um, presumably they were painting aeronautical dials in Britain and in Germany and France. Did you yeah. find, or in your research, were there other centers and did they have similar problems? Um, what I found in my research, um, and obviously I focused on America, um, dial painting happened all over the world, you know, particularly in Switzerland, which has a massive, you know, watch and clock industry. There was dial painting there, but they didn't lit point. And that seems to have had a major difference in terms of the health effects, obviously, because uh, they weren't putting it in their mouths and they weren't getting that necrosis of the jaw that the American women got from lip pointing. In other countries, they would use um, a metal needle, which obviously you're not going to put in your mouth, or they'd use a glass pen, or in France, they used uh, cotton wadding uh, on a stick to paint. But what I think is really interesting is since I published the book and it came out in the UK last year, I've actually had messages from people. I had a message from a woman who lived in Yorkshire who said her aunt died in her early 20s and she was a radium girl in Yorkshire. And she asked me if I knew anything about it and I had to say no because I hadn't come across anything in my research about that. Now, that girl wouldn't have been lip pointing, but of course she was working with radium. And she was working with it at a time when everyone thought radium was safe and where there were no safety standards and where they were very lax in how they were handling this highly radioactive substance. So even though 
there wasn't the same horrific symptoms and there weren't the big legal cases elsewhere. I think just anecdotally, just by kind of joining the dots, I think there will have been other radium girls in other countries who will have died from their radiation exposure, but they're not documented in the same way. That's me joining the dots myself from messages like that one I received. So uh, you uh, talked a little bit about the cover-up, which seems to be ubiquitous, mm. you know, when there's corporate yeah. crimes like this. How long did that cover-up go on? And, uh, you know, once that they know that, uh, you know, they're harming people, you know, if they continue to do that, well, then that's a crime. So did anyone uh, actually pay the price for this? But the cover-up cover went on for years, uh, for decades, and you're quite right that once they knew it was dangerous, um, you know, they should have stopped it immediately, and they didn't. And actually, one of the things that was really shocking to me was that the book actually uh, has a dual narrative. So it's looking at Catherine Sharp and Grace Fryer in New Jersey, but it's also looking at Catherine Donahue and Charlotte Purcell in Illinois. And the Illinois studio opens in 1922, uh, funnily enough, it opens, or the advert that runs where they want the girls to come and work there, it runs two days after the first radium girl is buried in New Jersey. So the women in New Jersey are already dying when they suddenly open this new firm. And it's a different company, I should say. It's not like they've suddenly moved everything. Um, but the thing that was shocking to me was reading that dual narrative. And obviously, Illinois, the Illinois company, know, because of what's happening out east, that this is dangerous because the girls in New Jersey are filing suit, and the radium company know that. And you know, I found records that showed they, behind the scenes, they tried to ensure that they weren't going to have the same problems. They started testing the women, and they started trying different techniques and so on. And so it was really shocking to me how they behaved because they could have used what happened in New Jersey as a warning. They could have used it to say, you know what, this is going to be the same and we're going to hold our hands up and we're going to tell the girls, you know what, this is dangerous, you need to stop. They didn't do that at all. They lied to them. They actively lied to them, as you'll read in the book. And in terms of you know, criminality, did anyone actually face any criminal you know, consequences for this, unfortunately, no, they didn't. The judge in the women's case said that there, you know, he thought there would be a case against them, but it never happened. You know, Catherine Donahue died, and she died in 1938. Well, in 1939, the Second World War began. You know, pe people had different priorities, and actually, one of the shocking things to me was that Joseph Kelly, who was the president of the company at the time the girls were getting sick. He was someone who, when I say they lied to the women in Illinois, they literally published an advert in the local paper that said they had found no signs of radium poisoning amongst the women, which was a lie. Their test results showed they were radioactive. They told the women uh, there was no danger. They said they would have closed the studio if they thought there was any danger at all. And it was Joseph Kelly who signed his name to that uh, advertisement that ran in the paper. Well, in the Second World War, he was actually um, given a citation by the government for his work on the <laughs> on the Manhattan Project and the atomic bombs and things like that because he supplied a lot of the radioactive materials. So, in terms of you know, are you going to go after someone and have him up on a murder charge for killing these girls? Well, not when he's a war hero and all of that sort of thing. So, there were no criminal charges against the company executives. And this is a good example of why the nuclear option is so critically horrible and can never happen and why people keep need to keep reminding politicians of why that is so horrible um, and need to do whatever kind of diplomacy that it doesn't happen anywhere in the world because of the, the immediate danger, and then we've seen from the um, the two bombs in Japan that the, there's immediate danger, then there's um, the next yeah, wave of danger, decades. and then it goes on for years and years, and, and many, many, and generations. Cancer, many, many cancers yeah. are increased years out, so yeah. this, 
this, and, and then the radiation is still there um, in some way or another, and it may not be contained. Yeah. There's a park in Seattle which used to have, um, it used to be a, um, a radi um, they used to do radium dial painting there for, for uh, because it used to be a, um, uh, a naval base where they did flights, and they had airplanes coming from there. And um, so they, they did a cleanup, but um, there's that, that part is contained, and that nobody could ever dig through the asphalt that is covering mm. that. And hopefully it is contained well enough. But th and this is this is going to be true everywhere that there's this type of exposure that's possible. Yeah, as you as you say, you know, it, it's a warning, isn't it? You know, you read what happens to these girls, and you think, um, surely this can't happen again. But it comes back to being vigilant. You know, we're all worried. I'm sure by reading headlines in the newspapers at the moment about you know escalating tensions with people that have nuclear weapons and you just you just hope you hope that people will see sense mm -hmm. yeah. yeah well thank you i've really enjoyed thank you so much <laughs>